All right, let's let's uh, let's start off with um, a quick prayer. Um, you know, no Masonic activity should ever be undertaken without invoking the blessing of deity. So um, let's uh, bow our heads momentarily. Uh, most holy and glorious Lord God, the great architect of the universe, the giver of all good gifts and graces, in thy name we have assembled and in thy name we desire to proceed in all our doings. Grant that the sublime principles of Freemasonry should so subdue every discordant passion within us. So harmonize and enrich our hearts with thine own love and goodness that this meeting at this time may humbly reflect the order and beauty which reign forever before thy throne. Amen. Don't be. Don't be. Thank you. Um, all right. With that in mind, let's uh, let's roll through a couple of quick announcements. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. I do have a brand new announcement. You guys get to hear it first here. Um, April 29, April 29th, that's uh, three weeks from tonight. Uh, Brother Chuck Dunning is going to host a panel of uh, Masonic mental health professionals who are experts in the field for exactly what we're going through right now through, through the uh, uh, trauma through the the uh, traumatic experience of uh, COVID-19 and the uh, issues that we're kind of playing with here. Um, with that in mind, this has never been done before. This is a pretty cool thing. We get to we get to see this first here. It's Masons helping Masons. It's going to be something that is uh, very powerful, very cool. Uh, I also recommend if you have opportunity, tune in tomorrow night to the Masonic Roundtable. They're going to be kind of hitting on this. I, I spoke with uh, Jason Richards earlier today. They're going to be hitting on the coping mechanisms that work for them. Um, they may or may not have uh, uh, somebody in that can speak to it. And it might be one of the people that's on the panel. We'll see. Um, but the panel itself is going to go a whole lot deeper. And it's going to be directly focused on this uh, directly focused on this. So you heard it here first. Well, most of you heard it here first. Uh, April 29th, that's going to be the panel discussion, uh, mental health panel discussion, Masons, who are mental health professionals, talking to us about the things that we can do as Masons, both for ourselves and for the community around us. I think that's pretty exciting. Then uh, tomorrow night, um, Brother Jake Thompson here out of the Valley of St. Louis is going to be doing a presentation on um, uh, Albert Pike and one of his more famous feuds around here. He, he kind of got into a little turf war and it was pretty cool. It was uh, or, or cool to see in retrospect. I'm sure he was quite agitated about it at the time. Um, that's going to be pretty entertaining. We'll put that out if it's not already, not already out on Reflected. Good Lord, if it's not already out on Refracted Light, we'll make sure to post it out as an event, um, uh, maybe tonight or early tomorrow morning. That will happen about an hour and a half or so before Masonic Roundtable, so there's no, uh, there isn't a conflict. Um, then, what other announcement am I missing? The next piece of the Masonic, uh, Joint Masonic Education that uh, Brother Jarzebek and, and Brother Ryan here have uh, been so kind to work on and uh, put together. Let's see, uh, April 15th, Chuck Dunning is going to do a presentation on the Platonic, let me, let me get this right, the, the view, Plato's view of wisdom, strength, and beauty, uh, and how the, how the, uh, how that view fits into masonry or, or can fit into masonry. So that's kind of neat. Then on the 22nd, we've got a couple of presentations. On the 29th, of course, is the, uh, um, the, the uh, mental health panel, the panel discussion on uh, Freemasonry and COVID-19. On May 6th, uh, Brother Mike Jarzebek will be doing a presentation on Vitruvian Man and the uh, uh, geometry surrounding Vitruvian Man, which is very, very cool. I'm very excited to hear that. And we'll, uh, uh, we're still working through finalizing the folks for the rest of May and into June. Did I get 
I tell you, we had planned on stopping this uh, in mid-June, but we don't know. We don't know what when we get the chance to go back to uh, Lodge. So we'll kind of play it by ear. With that in mind, um, I had the pleasure of seeing Brother Kaminsky do this presentation um, in maybe a little bit different form at Mid-Atlantic Esotericon. And it blew me away. It was, it was a phenomenal presentation. I really wanted to bring him in and uh, get opportunity for us to um, uh, get opportunity for us to see it. And one thing I'm not doing yet, I did not record. So where's my record button? There it is. And I'm about to record it. Is uh, Brother Kaminsky ready to, to start here? I think so. Can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. Absolutely. Do you, do you need me to press any buttons or? Do nope, anything? you're you're good to go. I'm going to go ahead and hit mute myself. Looks like everybody else is muted, and uh, let's rock. If you need something from me, uh, feel free to speak up or hit me in the chat room. Thank you. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Um, before we begin, I just want to say thank you to Brother Randy and everyone else who is working hard to put this together because this is uh, really filling a void for many of us. Uh, so I appreciate that. Um, and also appreciate all of you attending this evening. Uh, <clears throat> and I hope you're feeling well and are healthy as you can be. Um, it's an odd time. Uh, I don't know that we've ever lived through something quite like this before. A lot of people are suffering right now and some in not in always in the same ways. So I hope we can be a little extra patient with ourselves and each other during this time. Um, this talk is the, the subject is a Renaissance philosopher named Giovanni Pico della Mirandola. Uh, I wrote my master's thesis on this topic, and that's really the origin of the talk that I'm going to be giving tonight. But I also want to make it clear, um, so your expectations are well-founded, that this is a very sort of off-the-cuff, spontaneous talk, and it's not rehearsed. There's no PowerPoint. Uh, I don't have any slides. Um, it's not rehearsed. So it's a little bit rough. And um, I hope that that doesn't detract from your enjoyment of it at all. Anyway, so to begin, uh, the philosopher himself, Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, I'm going to refer to him from this point forward simply as Pico because it's easier. Um, he was born in 1463 uh, outside a Italian, northern Italian town of Modena. And he was a child prodigy. Um, he knew at least, I think, six languages, including ancient Greek and Latin. Um, he had, uh, you know, private tutors. He came from a very wealthy aristocratic family. Um, so he went to university at a very young age. I think he was like 14 to study canon law. In addition to all of the other subjects that were part of a classical Western European education at that time in the late 1400s. And he excelled in his studies and he was recognized by his peers as brilliant, a prodigy. They called him sort of the candle of the age in terms of his intellectual capabilities. Um, so where Pico really steps onto the world stage is um, he wrote a document called the 900 Theses. And in this text, he basically 
argues that um, there is such a thing as a primordial ancient wisdom tradition from which all major world religions and philosophical systems descend from. In addition, he talked about that the only way to truly verify the truth of the Christian religion was through Jewish Kabbalah and natural magic. So this was obviously like incredibly heretical. And the fact that he had publicly declared this in writing and then intended to debate his 900 theses with whoever wanted to debate with him in, at the Vatican in front of the church fathers and the Pope. That was his plan. Um, he was willing to go so far as to actually pay the expenses of anyone who wanted to travel to Rome to engage in this disputation with him. And I think on some level, he believed that if he could prove his argument in, in that setting, that in, in some way he would uh, ensure his own transcendence. Um, and it's not really clear if that's a, a philosophical transcendence uh, mystical transcendence, or if you read his writings, maybe even a physical transcendence, unlikely, obviously, but it's hard to say with Pico because he tended to be a little flamboyant and ostentatious. So, um, it was hard to know exactly what lay behind his words. And it's said, you can never know another man's heart, but, um, on some level, Pico believed that publicly defending his ideas in front of the religious authorities of his time was really the main way that he could both publicize his ideas, validate them, and ensure his own success in a, not in a worldly way, but in a, in a sublime way, if you will. So, the Pope and the Church Fathers promptly condemned Pico's work. He was excommunicated. His books were burned if they were found. And he was forced to flee. So uh, he was actually captured fleeing Rome. He was on the road to Paris at the time. And... Um, it was interesting because uh, because of what he had done, there was a good chance he was going to be executed. Um, but the uh, the patron of the city of Florence, the Medici, stepped up and basically said, "This is Lorenzo de Medici, the probably the wealthiest, most well known citizen of Florence." maybe all of Italy at the time, and said, I will take Pico under my care and I will vouch for him and he will not cause you any more trouble. So the Pope agreed. They gave him to Lorenzo de' Medici and um, he basically sort of escaped his fate if you will. Um, it was at that point that then Pico wrote what is known as an apologia, which is really more of a justification or an explanation for his 900 theses. And this apologia has been excerpted um, into a text that we know as the oration on the dignity of man. And this excerpt on the dignity of man is 
considered to be the foundational document of Renaissance humanism. Um, because as part of the text, Pico declares the primacy of humanity, but not because humans are somehow the rulers of the world or better than any other creatures. Like, he's not talking about any sort of independently inherent superiority at all. He's really talking about humans are superior because they have the capability to unite with the divine. And that's purely what he was aiming at here. Um, so in a sense, yes, he was promoting an idea of humanism, but not in the way that we know humanism today, I don't think, in, at least in my opinion. Um, so I want to give you a little bit of an idea of what this oration on the dignity of man is, is talking about, because it sort of sets the groundwork for discussing Pico's ideas about angels and thereby his ideas about mysticism and how those are all related and grounded in very traditional, authentic, mystical sources, which is unique in its own way. And, and just as an aside, uh, this is unique because prior to Pico, no Christian had really been able to access, let alone penetrate the mysteries of the Jewish Kabbalah. But Pico, for a variety of reasons, um, one of which was his skill with languages, uh, it allowed him to learn Hebrew in less than a year. Um, he had tutors and translators that lived and traveled with him. So he had access to them at all times. So he could learn and study not only the Hebrew language, but also the Jewish mystical tradition of Kabbalah uh, at the same time. Now, these translators and tutors that Pico worked with were converts. They had been Jewish Kabbalists that lived in Spain. The Spanish Inquisition came through. They were forced to convert to Catholicism, and they ended up in Italy working for Pico because the really the only skill they had was the language they knew and this mystical tradition that they practiced. But they were what seems to be sincerely Christians at that point. So when they were educating Pico about the Kabbalah, they put a certain slant on it uh, as pointing out aspects of Kabbalistic tradition that seem to naturally reinforce the veracity of the Christian religious tradition. Um, and we can talk about an example of that as we go through this. Um, but back to the oration on the dignity of man. Um, so I'm just going to read some quotes here from you, just so you get an idea of what Pico is talking about. Um, he says, uh, if you come upon a philosopher winnowing out all things by right reason, he is a heavenly, not an earthly animal. If you come upon a pure con contemplator, ignorant of the body, banished to the innermost places of the mind, he is not an earthly, not a heavenly animal. He is more superbly a divinity clothed with human flesh. You know, and prior to this, in the text, he's talking about the fact that, that man really has the capability to be whatever it is he puts his mind to. If man puts his mind to uh, physical pleasures, he's like an animal. Um, if he is obsessed with security and safety and home, he's like a plant. Um, you know, but he says man does have the, this quality, this capability of allowing him 
to put his mind on things that are of a higher nature, he might say. So then you get philosophy, um, you get contemplation, and you get divine union, ultimately. Um, so he says, let us spurn earthly things. Let us struggle toward the heavenly. Let us put in last place whatever is of the world and let us fly beyond the chambers of the world to the chamber nearest the most lofty divinity there as the sacred mysteries reveal the seraphim cherubim and thrones these are three orders of angels he said these occupy the first places ignorant of how to yield to them and unable to endure the second places let us compete with the angels in dignity and glory when we have willed it, we shall not at all be below them. So he's saying the natural order of things seems to be the divine, the angels in various orders, and then humans. But he says that does not have to be that way. He says we can sort of take the place of the angels, if not become angels in a sense. Um, and how do we do that? He says, if we too live that life, the angelic life, for we can, we shall equal their lot. The seraph burns with the fire of charity. The cherub shines with the radiance of intelligence. The throne stands in steadfastness of judgment. And moreover, he who is a seraph that is a lover is in God and more God is in him and God and he are one. So again, he's really reinforcing this idea of a mystical union with the divine and not to put too fine a point on it, but classically from a mystical perspective that can be best understood as the collapsing of subject-object dichotomy, uh, that which sees and that which is seen are the same and not two. It's basically uh, an, a non-experience of non-duality, if that makes sense. Um, so, and then he he's really narrowing in on these orders of angels, the way they function, their, their actual job as a way that man can live that sort of life. So he says, therefore, with his own light, the cherub in the middle makes us ready for the seraphic fire and at the same time illuminates us for the judgment of the thrones. He is the bond of the first minds, the order of palace, the ruler over contemplative philosophy. We must first rival him and embrace him and lay hold of him. Let us make ourselves one with him and be caught up to the heights of love. And let us descend to the duties of action, well instructed and prepared. So here he's talking specifically about these three orders of angels. So we, if we think of them as a, uh, a hierarchy, the seraphim are at the top closest to the divine. Next, you have the cherubim, and below the cherubim are the thrones. And then, at this point, he's looking at the, the function of them. So the seraph, the seraphim, they are devoted to God. They sing God's praises. And then the cherubim are involved in intellectual pursuit. So learning philosophy. This is how he interprets the cherubim. And then the thrones are involved completely with this idea of proper conduct and right action and good judgment in the world. So you can see this sort of breakdown uh, is really crucial because he's talking about you have to know philosophy you have to know the world you have to know who you are and what the world is then and only then would you be able to 
be able to understand what the divine is. And once you can understand what the divine is, then you can truly have devotion. And it's only yes. when one has devotion that one can act with proper conduct and judgment and action in the world. So that's the sort of schema that he's working with here. Um, and that's basically how his um, ideas about angels inform his mystical tendencies, if you want. Now, you notice in that section, he talked about wrestling with the angel, alluding to this story of Jacob's ladder in the book of Genesis, which is important because um, when he invokes Jacob's ladder, it's not simply as a path from the worldly life to the divine life. It's also an allusion to the Jewish Kabbalistic tree of life, the Eitz Chaim, that uh, we find in Kabbalah. Um, and that's not just my idea. This has been written about by scholars as well. Um, and he goes, and Pico goes on in the oration to say, if we want to be the companions of the angels moving up and down Jacob's ladder, this will not be enough unless we have first been well trained and well taught to move forward duly from rung to rung, never to turn aside from the main direction of the ladder and to make sallies up and down. When we have attained that by means of the speaking or reasoning art, then be sold by a cherub spirit, philosophizing along the rungs of the ladder of nature and penetrating through everything from center to center, we shall at one time be descending, tearing apart like Osiris, the one into many by a titanic force. And we shall at another time be ascending and gathering into one the many like the members of Osiris, by an Apollonian force, until finally we come to rest in the bosom of the Father, who is at the top of the ladder and are consumed by a theological happiness. So here he's, he, he's making a very important point, several actually, but, but one of them is that the function of the human mind, the, the, the normal habitual function of the human mind is to grasp at things, at objects, whether they are physical objects or conceptual objects, but grasp to them nonetheless, because uh, as the mind grasps to it, it wants to know it. And the way that it knows it is by dissecting it and classifying it and dividing it up into ever smaller, more minuscule units of knowledge and information. We call it data. It's bits of information. That's, knowledge. That's what knowledge is composed of. But wisdom is not that. Wisdom is the opposite. Wisdom is a, is not a breaking down. It is a built reunification. So uh, the only way I could express what wisdom is in relation to knowledge would be it's an unknowing, an unlearning, and ultimately an unbeing. But that that's a little bit later. Um, so Pico's making that point very specifically here that, that ultimately this, this mystical union with the divine um, requires a unknowing and an unlearning of all the bits so they can be known again in their real or true sense, which is no separation between anything as only the divine and nothing else. Um, now, 
just to be mindful of our time, I want to talk a little bit about why it is that Pico was so enamored with uh, Kabbalism and the Jewish Kabbalah when he encountered it. Because there were a few reasons that it was really a huge revelation to him. One of them was that this was really the only living, authentic, mystical tradition that he had access to. Because if we think about it, uh, Egyptian mysteries are long dead. Greek mysteries, long dead. Uh, anything from the Roman world, long gone. Um, there might have been Christian mysteries, but by the late 1400s, I'm not sure they were still around. They might have been more underground. Uh, for whatever reason, Pico didn't have access to that. Um, so, and there were, you know, they didn't have uh, direct knowledge or access to anything, you know, east of Greece, really, at this point. So they didn't have access to, you know, any sort of Dharma teachings, whether Hindu or Buddhist or, or anything of that nature. So the Jewish Kabbalah was a living tradition and he had men who he had access to who could teach it to him so this was huge the second major reason that it was so important was because as a wisdom tradition the jewish kabbalah is still monotheistic so this is crucial right because you know pico is a catholic and uh, you cannot go venerating a uh, polytheistic or pagan tradition. Um, you know, it's, venerating Judaism is bad enough at this point, but um, at least it's monotheistic. They, they have Moses as sort of a common ancestor, if you will. Um, so in that sense, it's acceptable. And then this sort of is a two-sided coin if you will, because this also means that Pico and other Christian philosophers who've adopted this Kabbalah in a Christianized form can then use it as a rhetorical weapon against Jews so that they can you know, they can't force them to convert, but they can argue for conversion based on the fact that in their minds, Kabbalism proves the truth of Christianity. Um, so that, that was a, a big, big part of why he found it to be important. Um, now, in his 900 Theses, Pico actually went so far as to reorder the angels from their traditional hierarchy. And I know in his oration, which he wrote afterward, he reverts back to the standard Christian hierarchy of seraphim, cherubim, and thrones. But in his own Theses, his interpretation of the correct order of angels put the cherubim at the top and the reason i believe he did this is because he saw the cherubim as specifically linked to humans through the mental faculty i mean there's this concept that mind that human mind on some level is unified is a single entity and that in the same way uh, the angels were to share a single mind or intellect and um, he also talks about the way that uh, these mystical 
traditions of Jewish Kabbalism. And he also goes into many others, um, philosophical traditions and other esoteric traditions from the ancient past, and talks about this idea of mystical union as, as being at the core, as the ultimate goal of these traditions, to produce a one who was completely united with the divine to such an extent that it was their everyday lived state. Um, because then such a person could then serve as the head of the tradition, they can teach, and they can instruct others in the methods to practice by which they could then attain that state. So it creates an actual lineage. Um, and that's what I mean when I talk about a living lineage in Jewish Kabbalism that he encountered. Um, so some of the other things that it's important to understand about Pico and his work um, is really the idea that, that he also promoted this idea of natural magic as a way to also, again, sort of unite with the divine. And he thought of natural magic in the way that we would think of sort of like ancient doctrines of correspondences, um, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, visualizations and meditations at certain times, um, saying certain prayers and certain you know, as it's part of his process. Um, so, and he definitely believed that this was um, useful, but he also believed that any sort of magic that made, you know, pacts with demonic entities or were designed to affect worldly circumstances or used astrology, he believed that was bad or evil, or certainly not um, any way to sort of gain this sort of access to the divine. Um, so it's really interesting, too, because if you trace back what Pico is talking about, um, especially in, in Jewish Kabbalism, you see a lot of parallels, especially when you look at the beginnings of the Hasidic tradition in Eastern Europe, um, because the Baal Shem Tov, uh, Re his grandson, Rebbe Nachman of Breslov, Joseph Caro, and you have several others, the Magid of Mezerich. Um, and these Kabbalists talk about almost the exact same thing that Pico is talking about, this sort of way to marshal your thoughts, because they say, where you place your thoughts is not only where you are, it's actually what you become. So whatever you spend the most time thinking about is ultimately what you are. Um, and this, this is a, a method of contemplation where one unites with the object being contemplated and this is sort of analogous to the whole process of mystical union. Um, so, and, and this idea of, of one sort of nullifying oneself, because the way that, that one unites with the divine is not through uh, self-concern. It's the complete abandonment of self-concern ultimately um, to, to such an extent that one is totally consumed by the divine only. Um, and so this idea of nullification is really also crucial to Pico and the Hasidic uh, mysticism. Um, so, and this is interesting to me because uh, Pico lived in Italy in the 1400s. These Kabbalists lived in Eastern Europe in the 1700s and 1800s. Pretty sure they never even heard of each other, let alone read each other's work at all. 
but yet they're talking about the exact same thing. And the question is, is that just through the nature of the discovery of how a human being connects with the divine? Or is that a result of teachings that have been handed down from mouth to ear over thousands or maybe longer, thousands of years, maybe longer? We don't really know for sure. So I think this is really fascinating in its own right. Um, now, Pico, he tried to keep his head down as best he could, but he couldn't really ever abandon his ideas. Um, he definitely toned them down. And in his future writings, you really had to search for hints at these sort of assertions. But uh, eventually what happened was, um, I believe it was the, uh, the army of King Charles was invading uh, Florence at that point. And uh, the Medicis had sort of fallen from power and Pico was sort of in their care. But because they were weakened, um, it allowed Pico's enemies an opportunity to have him murdered. So at age 31, um, Pico was poisoned and uh, they believe it was his uh, secretary who did it. And um, what happened after was his heirs tried to recast Pico uh, so that he would not be seen in history as a heretic, as a promoter of Kabbalism and magic. They wanted him to be seen as a, a brilliant philosopher with, who had a little dalliance uh, with heresy as an ex over exuberant youth, but then became a pious Christian and uh, lived a saintly life afterward and um, died uh, too young. And that's sort of like the whitewashed image that they pretended to the world for generations. And it wasn't until uh, the 20th century, the late 20th century, that scholars started digging in and translating the 900 theses and bringing it back to light and discovering the true nature of Pico's work. I mean, if you look at what he did, ultimately, I feel fairly strongly he was the godfather of western esotericism without pico i don't know when or where or how kabbalism would have come into western esotericism from pico you have johann reuschlin who brought hebrew and kabbalah into germany and from reuschlin and Pico, you have Cornelius Agrippa of Nettesheim, who wrote the books of occult philosophy, the third book of which was entirely concerned with Kabbalah, Christian Kabbalah, of course, but nonetheless. Um, and from Agrippa, you have the entirety of, of Western esotericism and ceremonial magic and, and tarot and uh, Western alchemy and all of the fraternal orders and esoteric societies. Um, and that doesn't even get into uh, Freemasonry at all, but you can be sure um, if you read the oration on the dignity of man, I think you'll find some, some hints uh, to ideas or um, concepts or language that you seen or heard or maybe even spoken yourself before. Um, so it's interesting. I think um, Pico is really important. Um, he brought forth a lot of really crucial concepts and he reignited the interest 
in this idea of an ancient wisdom tradition in the West. So for that, I think, you know, to any, to any extent that you have an interest in that at all, you owe a debt of gratitude to Pico because without him and his willingness to put his life on the line to bring forward these ideas is tremendous. Uh, and I think it is not often appreciated because, you know, we're often more concerned with things like silence or secrecy or uh, not being, you know, casting pearls before swine. Um, but Pico, for him, this was this was like a, a life mission because he was not going to die without the world knowing that there was a singular wisdom tradition that informed you know, all religion and philosophy. And for him, it was worth any price that he had to pay. So um, I find that compelling and uh, maybe you do too. Well, anyway, I guess I'm wondering if anybody has any questions at this point, because I probably babbled on for long enough. Okay. Patty, do you see anything here? Is there anything in the chat room on uh, uh, on the live feed? I don't see anything on there yet. All right. We've got some good conversation going in the chat. We just don't have any uh, particular oh, questions. Wait. Okay, wait. It was only showing two. It, Dave Felty uh, posted some really interesting background information in the chat. I, this is Joe. I see a question from Rob Jackson, uh, Greg. He asked okay. the preferred translation for study. Oh, I like those. This, I'm sorry. my. At this point, my room's too dark, but it's um, it's the Hackett version. Uh, translations by Glenn, uh, Charles Glenn Wallace, Paul J. W. Miller, and Douglas Carmichael. Um, Hackett Publishing Company, Inc., Indianapolis. Uh, copyright 1965. pretty sure it's on Amazon. Um, there are free, uh, you know, online versions of this, but the reason I like this one is because it, it has a nice introduction. It includes on the dignity of man, that essay, it includes another essay called on being and the one where Pico tries to reconcile the views of Aristotle and Plato. Um, and this is sort of the debate as to, you know, whether the divine is the ultimate one or whether it's beingness. But the funny thing is they're the same thing. So <laughs> spoiler alert, um, Heptapolis is also included in this uh, version, which is um, Pico's exposition on the seven days of creation of the Bible. So uh, it's pretty sweet um, if you're into this kind of thing. Uh, I don't know if there's any other questions or. Uh, I have a question. If uh, yeah. uh, Brother Hadi from the Lebanon Lodge, Number Ten Grand Lodge of New York. Uh, Greetings. First of all, thank you for the uh, for the presentation. Uh, you obviously uh, uh, you are not uh, telling uh, uh, talking uh, talking what you are living. I could see how you were talking that you, you are living the spirit of uh, Pico's uh, mentality. My question is, uh, you said that without Pico, the, the West couldn't have known Kabbalah and the relation, or he is the godfather of Christian Kabbalah relation. 
uh, do you think there is a school at the moment uh, uh, that you can say uh, Pico school of uh, this Kabbalah Christianism relation? Um, I don't think so at this point. I think when Pico was alive and shortly thereafter, you could have said there was an identifiable sort of school of thought that he inspired, which would have included Johann Reuschlin and uh, Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa. But I think the issue we have in modern times is that this is something I mentioned, I think, before we actually started the live stream, that um, I consider Pico as sort of like the ultimate figure in the lineage of Western esotericism. But most of the people who study or practice this don't. They consider a contemporary of Pico's named Marsilio Ficino as the sort of godfather of Western esotericism. And the difference between these two men is like the difference between the earth and the sky. It is that stark. Pico was young, exuberant, brilliant, uh, shooting star. Ficino is uh, mature would be kind. He's a Catholic priest. Uh, he, he is brilliant, but he's safe, and he's not certainly not going to risk his life to proclaim any wild ass ideas about any you know ancient wisdom tradition. Um, Ficino's the one who translated the Corpus Hermeticum and many of the works of Plato. Um, so <clears throat> the idea, okay. yeah. Greg, I'm just saying, Dave Felder here. I was just going to say that I had been studying uh, Pico since I was, I'm an old guy, since I was an undergrad in the 1960s. And uh, there were, and you go back to the, to the uh, Golden Dawn, and when they all cracked up, uh, A.E. Waite, who was a Mason, uh, he, he kind of uh, was more of a Pico guy yes. than an Egyptian guy. Yes. And so that means that Steiner, Paul Foster Case, William Butler Yeats, A.E. Waite, Owen Barfield, Charles Williams, and C.S. Lewis are all Christian Kabbalists in the Pico de la Mirandola tradition. So it's quite alive today, I would say. At least at least it is as long as I'm still alive. And I got a virus with my name on it hunting for me right now. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point, too. I think also you could probably put... Um that book Meditations on the Tarot in that bucket, which is probably like the, in yes. my opinion, that would be like the ultimate example of a modern text that is propagating Pico's perspective. And Chick Cicero's work, it pops in there once in a while too. Okay. I ha can't, I haven't read it, but I take your word for it. So, but the, the, uh, the basic gist of it is that, if one is practicing magic that's not entirely theurgical, then you're sort of following in the tradition of Ficino and his descendants, which would include the Golden Dawn and other groups. If you're talking about a contemplative Christian tradition, um, that's that's really where Pico is aiming at. Um, he's really, he's really talking about mysticism and not a, about operative magic or astrology in any way. Um, you have meditation, contemplation, visualization, um, you know, and there's probably other things that you could include in that as methods, like, for instance, in the Orthodox Christian tradition they have the jesus prayer so that that would be sort of in line with these sort of methods uh, just to say remember though in the in the um the uh, Etapolis, mm -hmm. uh he takes bereshit first word of uh, genesis and tries to build the whole of human knowledge out of the one word in the one chapter right so that, that's it was, 
interesting concept too. And that also is not uh, unique to him. I mean, if you look at uh, many mystical traditions have a similar idea. In fact, there's the anecdotal story of the, I think it's the Baal Shem Tov, and he's with one of his disciples. And somehow there's been a massive flood and the world's been wiped out. And the Baal Shem Tov is saying to his disciple in the boat, like, oh, I can't remember anything. It's like, he's like, help me. I, I'm trying to remember the entire tradition. And he says, Aleph. And he's, and then he says, and he's like, nope, nope, I've got it. Aleph is enough. I got the whole thing. You said enough. So from that, even from that single letter proceeds the entirety of all, of all human wisdom. So um, yeah, that, that's definitely a, a, an idea with a long pedigree. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. I find personally that this work uh, appeals to me because uh, his ideas about contemplation and mysticism are entirely valid from my experience. And I think it would behoove us, if people are interested in this, they, they should really investigate it further because um, I don't know. I don't know how much I should say here, but uh, from what I've been taught, so um, this is not my ideas anymore. Um, the, the purpose, if you will, of a human being, the ultimate purpose is to know the divine. And that's important because it is said that the divine can only know itself through a, a human right? The divine is unknowable. It's ineffable. Um, all of these, these words that, that evoke this sort of uh, apophatic uh, theology, that it can't be spoken of, right? But it can be known and it can be spoken of through the mind. So if, if one resolves their mind in wisdom, then the divine can be known and the ultimate human purpose can be achieved. So from that perspective, I feel like this is the most important thing there is. So that's how I feel about it. I agree with you. I get stumped on that part of where you can't talk about things and then how is it going to get sent out as a legacy to all humans, you know, or the ones that are seeking. So that's the confusing part for me. Mm -hmm. Because if you talk about it, it goes away for a while. And then you have to reground and go back. Well, that's why these wisdom traditions have methods because as a, we as human beings can't hold that grace. Like if you think about it, like uh, our body and mind is like an alchemical vessel. But until one undergoes the discipline and the training of an esoteric school with a teacher and methods of practice, it's like we're a colander. The grace flows in and it just runs right out. But if one disciplines their body mind and practices with devotion you can forge an alchemical vessel that will actually hold that grace and it will not run out as I've been told. I mean, I I'm, I'm working on it. I don't really know, but um, it seems to be true. So at certain levels of attainment or realization, there is a capacity to hold that uh, and to, hold it in a stable manner. Um, but it's rare. I mean, it's, 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 as they say, it's as rare as stars in the daytime. So we do the best we can. That's really, that's really it. We do the best we can with what we can. Brother Greg, I got a question for you. Sure. 
So uh, last June we talked briefly, and maybe this was an offline discussion. I got to tell you that that it might have been over a beverage or two or more. And um, one now. So hey, <laughs> uh, margaritas are us. Um, <laughs> We talked about Pico's uh, interest and depth of knowledge in low magic and high magic and the differences where the priests were keeping high magic to themselves, where Pico really got into the trouble was kind of bridging that. And I wondered if you might expand or expound a little bit upon uh, a little more of that. Yeah, I mean, one idea that the church always seemed to promote was that you couldn't access the divine directly, right? You needed a priest or a bishop or some, someone with, who was invested with the proper authority to represent you, you know, to the divine you know who could act on who could speak on your behalf really so there was this idea of an intercessor um so pico discards that altogether completely in saying that no you can unite directly with the divine you don't need to go through another human being you and and to be clear you know his kabbalism was certainly christian but he doesn't explicitly say you have to go through Christ either, right? Like he's really breaking this down into like fundamentally what works from a method methodological perspective. And he says from a methodological perspective, what works is acting like an angel, behaving like an angel, is supposed to behave and thinking like an angel is supposed to think and putting your mind on the divine like an angel does not for your sake but for the divine's sake so it's really like an inversion of the typical mental function where the habitual human mind state tends towards self-concern me what do I want? What do I need? How can I be happy? How can I be satisfied? Blah, 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 blah. And it never friggin' ends. The inversion of that is care. Focusing on the world, on other people, on people who need help, on what the divine is, on what the divine wants from us. So it's really an inversion on that. And that sort of identification as the divine or the deity is that's theor theurgy so one can engage in theurgy through contemplation or ritual ceremony or both simultaneously um i think the main thing here is uh there are different methods to reach similar states of consciousness or awareness but um the what you refer to as the low magic this would be worldly magic uh, magic that's concerned with manipulating worldly circumstances money sex power almost exclusively um so those are considered lower forms of desire in humans, right? So when Pico talks about animalistic or plant-like behavior, that's what he's referring to. So in the higher desire would be the desire for the divine. Um, and, and ultimately, I think this goes to the root of what's going on here. It's not that people engage in high magic or low magic because some people are better than others it is not about that everybody wants to be happy but we 
don't understand the true origin of happiness. So oftentimes we pursue what seems like it will make us happy, money, sex, power. Um, but the, the gratification we experience from attaining those things is very short lived. When you compare it to the feelings of joy and bliss that one experiences um, in pursuit of mystical union or of the divine in general, um, they have a very different flavor. The experience is vastly different. Again, it's like the earth and the sky. Um, one is, is really about abandoning self-concern and finding joy in whatever circumstances you happen to be in. The other is about being self-concerned and never being comfortable enough with the circumstances. So you always have to try to manipulate them. And even when you do, you're still not happy. So these are just sort of the perspective that we're, we're looking at it from. Um, and again, I don't think there's anything wrong with being happy. I just, my experience and my belief tells me that we don't truly understand the origins of what happiness is. Um, so I think that goes to the root of it. Um, and Pico, I think, understood this on a fundamental level, even as a basically like a teenager or a 20 in his early 20s, he understood this, which is, I think, pretty phenomenal um, because to have that level of maturity at a young age is really rare. I certainly didn't. Me neither. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure where I want to follow up with that. So let's go ahead and uh, get some other folks. Uh, any questions that you have? Um, any folks on the call? Randy, can I ask another one? Please. Hey, Greg, I miss you, man. Yeah. Miss you too, Rob. Um, so what you just said resonated with me a lot. Do you think it could be that the it is the, the path of the journey to divinity, right? You will never get there, but it is the being content on that path and where you are in the path that would be ultimate happiness as opposed to from the worldly aspect, from the possessive aspect, you always think, if I get this, I'll be happy. If I get this next job, I'll be happy. But what ends up happening is for the physical items, it's almost like you're you're stopping along the path and you're realizing that that doesn't fulfill anything. <laughs> and I mean, as humans, we want challenges, right? We want to be on a path. We want to... Um, we want to be figuring something out and it, just the existence of being on that path towards divinity, which is unattainable as opposed to physical items, which are unattainable, but unsatisf unsatisfying. Attainable, but satisfying. Yeah. Un attainable, but unsatisfying. Yeah. 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 Um, well, you're right. I think the path of wisdom is, never ending. I mean, even if one attains full enlightenment, it's not ending. And I'm not talking from my experience, because I, I don't, I'm not enlightened at all. I'm, I'm, just, I'm as, as dumb as anybody. Uh, but I've, I know people who are, and they are, st they like, they're enlightened and they still practice every day. Like they don't stop. Like they're not like, Oh, I've done it and it's over. No, they're like, you just keep going. And like, it keeps unfolding. It doesn't actually stop. It just keeps going. Uh, and it reminds me of a, uh, my teacher always talks about this roomy thing where uh, this something about uh, I am the slave to that one for whom not every rest stop is the end of the path. 
right? Because we always kind of take whatever we do, like, oh, I've done it now. That's the end of the path. I've accomplished it. I've attained it. But there's never, there's no end. Even full enlightenment isn't an end. There's, how could it be? I think your mic's off, Rob. Yeah, I'm talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking you just have to be, you have to be happy where you are and accept where you are and understand that's not the end of the path. Yeah, but also um, it helps if you practice methods that turn your attention from self-concern. Because, yeah, yeah, like part of it is, is finding joy, but also part of it is like reorienting your perspective to, to realize that that joy was always there. It was just you that weren't. <laughs> Does that make any sense? Yeah. Uh, Rob and Greg, I think it is, uh, if we can say it, as long as deep you go into a certain doctrine and you get involved, as long as you, you see that you will always be thirsty and you need to be more uh, in need of that source. That's why uh, uh, people who get involved, they will never say I'm satisfied. They will always say I need more. As long as I deep uh, uh, dig inside, I see, oh my God, I'm still at the beginning of the path. That's exactly correct. As my teacher just said, Three weeks ago, he was giving a, a teaching and he said, this is for all of you who are beginners on the path. And he looked around the room and he said, you're all beginners on the path, even those of you who have been here 30 years, because the path works swiftly. And if you were really engaged with the path, you'd already be enlightened. If you're not enlightened, you're a beginner. And that's basically the, the approach, like the path works very swiftly. But if, if you haven't attained that, it's, you're, you're still at the beginning point. You're right. And we have to be ready and willing to start over all the time because we make mistakes. Uh, we don't follow instructions properly. Um, we get things wrong. We think we did something correctly, and maybe we didn't. And if we're not willing to start over from the beginning and do it again, you know, it's, it's, I don't know that how you could succeed because I think part of succeeding is starting over until you get it right. Did you have any other questions, brother? Brother Greg, thank you very much for this conversation and this uh, presentation. This was very, very cool and much appreciated. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure and I appreciate the opportunity very much. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to close with a brief, very brief prayer, if that's okay. Please do. All right. At this very moment, for the people of the world and the nations of the earth, may not even the words disease, famine, war, and suffering be heard, but rather may their moral conduct and merit, wealth and prosperity increase, and may supreme good fortune and well-being always arise for them. So mote it be. So mote it be. Thank you, brothers. Thank you very much. Brother Greg, this will take me a little bit to uh, get to uh, um, uh, compiled and uh, um, uh, back to a presentable format to you. I'll get this over to you just as soon as I can. Great. Thank Folks you. on the call, thank you, thank you, thank you again.
Uh, much appreciated. And we'll uh, see you uh, next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Good night. Good night.